Hi everyone, good morning. Good morning and welcome to this week's Learn with Lorna, the number, uh, number 155, where we'll be looking at the Highlands and Islands Medical Service. My name is Lorna Steele McGinn. I'm the Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archive Service, which has four archive centres around uh, the Highlands of Scotland. We have one in Inverness, one in Portree, one in Fort William and one in Wick. And together the four of them make up the Highland Archive Service that looks after historic documents relating to the Highlands of Scotland and gives access to them and tries to share some of the stories from them uh, through things such as this. Um, I just wanted to start really by saying it's been so lovely to see so many people over the last few days. I've done a lot of events um, in Inverness and Fort William and Dingwall and uh, live to Australia, all sorts of different things. It's just been really lovely to meet so many people and, and uh, chat to them. So if you're one of the people that I met for the first time, please do say hello because it was, it was really nice. Um, this series, as you'll know if you've been watching for a while, is brought to you by Highlife Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highlands, a charity registered in Scotland, and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series. But if you're able to donate towards our work, then we're really, really grateful for that. So welcome, as I said, to episode number 155, where I'm going to tell the story of a completely revolutionary system of healthcare in the Highlands from 110 years ago. I've wanted to share this story for ages, and I have touched on it through various episodes and um, little bits of it. But I wanted to share it and leave it to share until this year as the 75th anniversary of the NHS. What has been the Highlands role in the story of the NHS? What was the Highlands and Islands Medical Service? If you attended the talk that Anne and I gave online, uh, Anne, our family historian, and I gave online a few weeks ago or a few months ago, uh, some of you may have heard some of this story. But there are things in that that I'm not putting in here and there are things in here that I didn't put in that. So um, hopefully this will be of interest. For many years, healthcare in the Highlands had been problematic. A large geographical area with dispersed communities. And many of these things re remain issues for all sorts of professions that we still cover a large geographical area of small communities spread out very widely. There was frequently difficult weather and difficult terrain to, to cross. Historically there had been insufficient numbers of trained doctors in the area, insufficient number of trained nurses, midwives and other medical professionals. And those that did exist had large catchment areas to cover. There was often a lack of transport to get across these areas and there was often poor communication across the Highlands and Islands. So I could go on and on. So this meant that for, for many, many years historically there were all kinds of barriers to the people of the Highlands and Islands being able to access adequate health care. It meant that many people went without health care because it was either too expensive because of course before the NHS we didn't have uh, free health care. So it meant it was either too expensive or simply too inaccessible in some other way. The poor state of healthcare in the Highlands and Islands was attracting attention across the country. So by the 1850s and over the following decades, numerous people were trying to raise awareness of these issues and to seek out some kind of resolution to fix the problem of healthcare um, access and quality. As I say, various people were kind of championing this, championing this cause, including the Caledonian Medical Society, who campaigned regularly for more doctors, for better paid doctors. And all of this was being listened to in the places of power. And David Lloyd George, who would go on to become the uh, Prime Minister, was at this time the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, took up the issues that were being uh, raised about the health care in the Highlands and Islands, but across Scotland more widely and across the country more widely. And as a result of him and various others listening, they, they introduced the 1911 National Health Insurance Bill. 
This was a very, very important piece of legislation. This entitled working people to insurance against loss of income due to illness or unemployment. So really for the first time, if you couldn't work because you were ill or if you lost your job, there was a backup system. There was an insurance system that meant that if you contributed to it and your employer contributed to it, there would be some recompense in, if you were unable to work. So a similar uh, situation to, to what we, we would recognise now as our health insurance, as our national insurance. The aim of this was to reduce pressure on the poor relief systems. I've spoken previously about the poor relief system, which was supporting at a local level people who were unable to work, but also to reduce the societal hardship that was coming about as a result of poverty. Now, as I say, this was an important and a game changing piece of legislation across the country for vast swathes of people. But the scheme excluded crofters who were often technically counted as self-employed and rarely received a regular financial income. And so this meant that as amazing and wonderful as the 1911 National Insurance Act was, it didn't actually benefit much of the Highland population. So where would they go from here? What was the next stage to ensure that those in the Highlands also were entitled to some kind of support? Well, the omission was noticed quickly and it was acknowledged as a problem and a committee was set up to investigate what could be done about this. How could they best serve uh, and include the Highland population? So the Highlands and Islands Medical Services Committee was was set up and this was a, a royal uh, commission set up to in, to look into this problem and the treasury minute for the time reads like this treasury minute dated 11th of july 1912 the chancellor of the exchequer recommends to the board that a committee be appointed to consider at an early date how far the provision of medical attendance in districts situated in the highlands and islands of scotland is inadequate and to advise as to the best method of securing a satisfactory medical service therein, regard being had to the duties and responsibilities of the several public authorities operating in such districts. So it's a very clear remit. They want to work out exactly what the problem is and what's the best way of addressing it. Sir John Dewar of Dewar's Whiskey fame uh, was appointed chairman for this committee and Murdoch Beaton, who was an inspector under the that National Health Insurance Commission, became secretary. And many of the other members of the committee were also Highland based with a real understanding of the challenges that were faced in the Highlands that were either unique or uh, unusual, or pe peculiar to the Highlands. And the committee immediately launched into a hectic plan of work. They started by reviewing and reading all the existing evidence. So they read reports, papers, they sent questionnaires out to doctors, to others, to initially start with getting an overview of what the current situation was. And then after absorbing all of that information, they set out to gather fresh evidence. They toured the Highlands and Islands to find out what the current situation was. And they described this, that decision in their final report. So I will come back to the final report, obviously, but in that final report, it includes some evidence of why they did what they did and how they undertook their research. It was decided that the committee should visit the area of the remit in order to not only take oral evidence on the spot, but also to investigate so far as possible by actual observation the various difficulties connected with medical provision in localities where they were understood to be particularly urgent. Accordingly, meetings were held at Inverness, Thurso, Kirkwall, Fair Isle and Lerwick, at Lairg, Betty Hill and Reconach in Sutherlandshire, at Stornoway and Garenheen in the island of Lewis, at Tarbert, Harris, at Lochmadi in North Uist, at Dunvegan and Portree in the Isle of Skye, and in Kyle of Loch Elsh, Perth and Oban. At the outset, however, evidence was taken in Edinburgh from representatives of central authorities connected with the Highlands and Islands. And finally, a meeting was held in Glasgow for a like purpose, also with a view to obtaining direct evidence 
as to the working of the dispensary system of medical provision in Ireland from two representatives, from the Local Government Board of Ireland and a medical practitioner from Donegal. So it really gives uh, an insight into how they approached it through reading what currently exists, through going to the place interesting there that they specify, not only wanting to take oral evidence on the spot, but through actual observation of the difficulties. And then organisations and individuals who would have input within the Highlands and Islands from elsewhere. So a very comprehensive way of gathering the evidence. There were 17 evidence sessions, gathering sessions that took place and you'll see from that list there everywhere from Fair Isle to Perth. So a huge geographical area of the Highlands and Islands um, and many places in between. And just travelling to these meetings immediately highlighted some of the issues being faced by doctors in the Highlands. When crossing the Minch to visit uh, the Western Isles, the, the weather was incredibly stormy and problematic. On another occasion, one of the committee uh, required emergency hospitalisation because he was struck by appendicitis and he therefore got first-hand experience of the difficulties of getting to the treatment. Where was the treatment? How could they get to it? How could they communicate the issues? There were over 250 witnesses spoken to, doctors, fishermen, crofters, so everybody from the health profession through to those experiencing uh, receiving the health care. They were questioned about their diet, about their living conditions, about issues around communication and transport, infectious diseases, midwifery, children's services and so many other things. So again, a very holistic view of not just, you know, what you might call basic a, a medical issue, but how does diet, how do living conditions, how do communication all impact to that bigger picture. And this evidence was all recorded and collated and amounted in the end to nearly 24,000 paragraphs of evidence. And those 24,000 paragraphs were grim and they created an image of multiple problems and multiple challenges. And we have a copy of this in the Archive Centre in Inverness of this evidence that was gathered. So let's break it down into some of the themes that came out. So if we look at living conditions, the evidence showed that most people in the Highlands and Islands lived with a small irregular income which barely covered their existence costs. Many lived in cottages that had earth floors which were dark and damp and smoky and insanitary and many still lived with animals in or very near where they were sleeping. There were issues these were issues that had already been raised with the uh, medical officers of health. So it's not that there was no awareness of this. And because of the way the committee gathered evidence, they would have seen that. They would have spoken to medical officers of health who would confirm these things. So, for instance, one of the medical officers uh, of health had already reported that he had been uh, in Stour and had described a widow's house as walls built of stone in and clay damp oozing through all parts, the roof slated but broken and leaking, woodwork rotten, floor of clay very wet and spring rising up in the closet so that the closet floor is really a quagmire. So there was an awareness of this already and the, the Highlands and Islands Medical Com Services Committee when they went around just compounded the evidence. So because of, if you imagine that description of the clay floor and the damp roof and the uh, sleeping, the quagmire floor, tuberculosis and other respiratory problems were really common. And most people's bodies had very little that they could fight any illness with. Diets were often poor and many people lived primarily on bread, potatoes, porridge and tea. In the evidence, we can see that doctors spoke, gave testimony to the fact that mothers often didn't have enough breast milk to feed their babies sufficiently and that the elderly faced so many struggles in trying to maintain good health. So it really starts to paint a picture of problems right through uh, the age generations, right through the geography as well. Once illness had set in, doctors were often not called or called only once or called too late because the cost was so prohibitive that many people would put off contacting them 
until the absolute last minute or like I say maybe once and get the um, get what they needed from them and then not call them again and often it was evidence that the doctors would go back anyway at no cost because they knew that there was a requirement to follow up. And doctors' evidence throughout these sessions testified to the problems that this caused. There were avoidable deaths happening and as I say there were doctors going for follow-up visits at their own expense because their conscience wouldn't let them not do it. In Koigach, about 80% of deaths were going uncertified. And if that doesn't seem extravagantly huge enough as it is, the Scottish average was 2%. So you can really see the issues that this was creating. Poverty was a huge issue and pride was a huge issue as well. I mentioned that doctors often fin shouldered the financial cost of visits to patients and then those visits frequently came at other costs to them and not just financial. Some doctors had cars but many had a single horse and many parts of the Highlands were scarcely populated with Highlanders living miles and miles from their nearest doctor. So therefore the journey that that doctor undertook to get to them could involve poor or completely non-existent roads, could include boats, could include uh, going on horseback, walking for miles, often in storms, in snow or in bad weather throughout the winter. And it meant that doctors, if they could be contacted in the first place, were often delayed in getting to patients or suffered poor health themselves as a result of their visit. Therefore, it could be hard to retain doctors. So this is some evidence for that. Such conditions of medical service are not inspiring. And when consideration is given to the hardships of travel to be endured, the isolation and consequent social and educational disability in rearing a family and the unsatisfactory conditions, hygienic or other, which, under which as a rule a doctor has to conduct treatment of disease, it is a matter of wonder that so many high professional, so many men of high professional attainment as we met should choose to continue to practice their profession in the remoter parts of the Highlands and Islands. Their reason for choosing such a sphere of labour are varied. Some are natives of or have family connections with the districts in which they practice or on the, and on that account have been drawn there too. Others have gone to the Highlands for reasons of health or have been attracted, free, open, have been attracted by the free open air life of the country. Many stay but a short time. Some who delay their departure, in most cases married men, are induced by the uncertainties of change to settle down and make the best of it. It's clear, however, that this attitude of toleration is not a wholesome one and that a primary step in the direction of rendering medical service adequate should be to place a doctor in such a position of financial competence and professional security as would enable him to carry out the highly responsible duties of his post with the fullest efficiency, zeal and contentment. So they're saying, you know, it's astonishing that anybody wants to, to work here at all. And when they do, often they don't stay. Now, I've spoken so far largely about doctors, but the evidence also revealed the gaps in nursing and in midwifery provision. It showed that nursing provision was patchy and dependent on local funding. Training was hit and miss, with many nurses having about three months of experience before being sent out. Many deaths were a direct result of the lack of appropriate nursing care and, of course, of the lack of midwives. And the Dewar Committee, in, in pulling all this evidence together, concluded that no matter, I want to read this directly, no matter affecting the welfare of the people of the Highlands and Islands is more urgent than the provision of trained nurses. So again, that importance, as we, as we know at the moment, of, of nurses in carrying out a huge amount of medical work. Now, there were hospitals in the area, but again, they were often a long journey for most people and some couldn't afford to be open all year or would turn people away if they were full. Some areas erected prefabricated hospitals for specific illnesses. So, for instance, they might quickly put up a tuberculosis hospital, but generally people were receiving treatment at home. And so you can see the situation that is being revealed by this evidence. There's poverty, hardship lack of provision. It's not universal. Of course, there are people who are well off, there are people who can afford 
uh, to, to pay for treatment. But frequently, for most people, things are very difficult. And all of this was recorded in the evidence and was used by the committee to write their concluding report. The concluding report, when it was published, was explosive. The scale of the problem was laid bare, in black and white, printed and published, and the government was in shock. And the people of the country were, were in shock. And it was agreed immediately that something needed to be done to rectify this issue. And the Dewar report concluded something absolutely revolutionary, and I, I love this phrase. The Dewar report concluded that the principle of health care is a basic human right, regardless of income, class or geography. I think that is such a powerful statement, and I know I've referenced that before. But to say that you're entitled to good health, no matter who you are and how much you earn. And that's all well and good, but how were they going to achieve that? They've proved their point that the situation was so uh, dr dramatic and, and awful, but how were they going to recommend improvements? Let me share an extract with the report uh, from you. So this is paragraph 160 to 163. It is clear that having regard to the economic conditions prevailing in the Highlands and Islands, the extent to which the foregoing services are at present subsidised from imperial funds is quite inadequate. And that as local resources are in many parishes already well nigh, if not wholly exhausted, any general ameli amelioration of the existing medical service cannot be achieved without a further and more substantial subsidy. So there's not enough money being put into it. It has been shown that in the Highlands and Islands, general medical practice rests very largely on the subsidy from the poor law authority and to a much less extent on subsidies from other public authorities. But it must be pointed out that the remuneration from these various authorities bears no proper relation to the work being done or the degree of responsibility involved. Consequently, individual practitioners are discouraged and medical service as a whole suffers. So the money that is coming in is not being uh, targeted or directly linked to where it's needed. Thirdly, the committee are of the opinion that by proper administration of an additional imperial grant, all of these public services could be so developed and correlated administratively as to provide a more satisfactory financial basis for general practices. So if we get a new lump sum of money, we can develop the services correctly. And then finally, for the administration of any subsidy granted by the Treasury for the carrying out of the policy indicated in this report, the committee suggests a central authority and a local authority be constituted. So we need a new body to oversee this. So they recommended a bespoke Highlands and Islands medical service be formed and funded, which would enable improved communications, salaries for doctors, recruitment and training of nurses, ambulance services and other things. And what's astonishing is their report had been so shocking, the evidence that they had gathered, that their recommendations were all adopted with speed and with consensus. And the committee had been appointed in July 1912 and in August 1913 the Highlands and Islands Medical Service was established with an annual grant of £42,000. So quite uh, extraordinary speed and extraordinary uh, agreement. Its first priority was to increase access to healthcare so that all patients were entitled to receive treatment at specified charges regardless of how far away they were from the doctor. Doctors were to be given a minimum salary of £300 per annum and grants were available for medical practitioners, for district nursing associations, for improvements of doctors and nurses houses, for ambulance services, for specialist hospital services and for telegraph and telegr uh, telephone service improvements. And those areas of focus meant that things rapidly began to improve, although of course the outbreak of the First World War did hamper some of that speed. So for instance from 1916 to 1920 parish and district nursing associations increased fivefold and into their constitutions they wrote a specific section in referencing the fact that they would be treating people under the Highlands and Islands Medical Service and that enabled them 
to tie into the grant available. So this meant that they became eligible because they had specifically referenced it and it allowed for over a hundred fully qualified nurses to be appointed to work alongside GPs. Money was also provided for their housing, for bikes, for motorbikes and cars. So access to primary health care was improved through the focus on doctors and nurses. Grants were also then given directly to hospitals and it was due to this that hospitals such as the McKinnon Memorial in Skye and the Belford in Fort William were able to remain open, which might have uh, otherwise not been possible. The board then looked at other areas that could be improved. They up-resourced the Royal Northern Infirmary, so the Royal Northern Infirmary had existed for some time by this point, um, over a hundred years, but they in, they upskilled and up-resourced and up-enabled, I don't know if any of those really are words, but um, that hospital, making it the central hospital, uh, or as the central hospital for the Highlands and Islands, they made it able to carry out specialist and laboratory services, which had been unavailable elsewhere. They improved telephone systems, wireless communications, they increased ambulance availability and later air ambulance provision. The Highlands and Islands Medical Service revolutionised care for over 300,000 people on half of Scotland's landmass and it was the first state-sponsored, state-provided healthcare system in the world. And the result was that the primary care available to all sectors of the Highlands and Islands community became a higher standard than that that was available to the rest of Britain. In the interwar years, so we've come through the end of the First World War and we're in the, uh, the, the 20s and, and uh, 30s, it became more and more apparent to everyone else that the Highlands and Islands now was getting a better standard of health care. And there was a desire to bring Scotland's overall health care up to the standard of the Highlands and Islands. And the committee was set up and it examined, amongst other things, the work of the Highlands and Islands ser uh, Medical Service. And in 1936, as a result of this, the Cathcart Report was published and it included this description. The Highlands and Islands Medical Service revolutionised the whole standard of medicine in an area where without assistance, comparable achievement would have been unobtainable and set a pattern for similar services in other parts of the world. Quite some testimony. The outbreak of the Second World War meant that the Cathcart Report's recommendations had to be overtaken by the more pressing need to build and establish emergency hospitals. But the preparation that had been done for a healthcare system for Scotland based on the Highlands and Islands Medical Service was yet to prove invaluable. And it was 1942 when the issue kind of re-emerged. William Beveridge, who had been involved with the 1911 National Insurance Act, set out his vision for dealing with the post-war issues of want, ignorance, squalor, idleness and disease. And again, he's looking holistically. He's not just looking at getting some more doctors. He's looking at everything from um, poverty, income, housing standards, diet. And he again looked at the Highlands and Islands Medical Service and his conclusion was this. The quite inadequate general medical service described by the Dewar Committee in 1912 is now a thing of the past. So he's saying what Dewar found when, when he went to look, that's, that's gone now. That poor state of healthcare is gone now. And in every district in the Highlands and Islands, the services of a doctor are available on reasonable terms. And the doctors which the medical service attracts are generally of a better type than some that were to be found in the area before. And Beveridge's report was again, like Dewar and like Cathcart, a bestseller. And this time Beveridge was a, a UK wide. And it included another revolutionary idea. Was it possible to have an entire welfare state? And it was this report, the Beveridge report, which led to the creation of the National Health Service, which had a far smoother start in Scotland than it did elsewhere because of the preparatory work that had already been done for the Cathcart report and because of the already existent 
uh, Highlands and Islands Medical Service. So the systems in Scotland and England and elsewhere have been different from the start and they remain different NHS Scotland, uh, different from NHS England. And on the 5th of July 1948, 75 years ago, the, with the establishment of the National Health Service, the rest of the UK caught up with the Highlands and Islands in receiving state provided health care. I just find it hard to imagine the transformation. There's a document within the collections that records, you know, as of this date on the 5th of July 1948, you will be entitled to, and it just lists midwifery provision, um, child care, you know, uh, paediatric support, um, hospital treatment. It's, it just lists as a bullet point list of all the things that when it turned 5th of July 1948, people were suddenly entitled to. And I just think it's uh, it's very easy for us to forget what a transformation that must have been. So I hope that you've enjoyed that. I really um, find the Highlands and Islands Medical Service absolutely extraordinary. And I don't think that we shout about it enough um, as much as we could anyway. So I hope that you've enjoyed hearing about that hugely groundbreaking, transformative work done by the Dewar Committee and what that has meant for healthcare in the Highlands and Islands and then subsequently the health the healthcare of the rest of Scotland and the UK. Thank you again for your company both here and uh, at events throughout the last few weeks. I've got so many more events coming up over the next few weeks so I'm sure I'll see more people at those. Um, if not I'll see you here next week where I'll be looking at the World War One diaries of William Campbell, a schoolmaster. Thank you again for joining me and a reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there is no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. If you're able to donate towards our work, we really are very grateful for that and there's a link to be able to do that within the text of this film. Thank you very much for your company and all your nice messages. I'm glad you found it interesting. Thank you.